Hey church, Pastor Jared here. Before we jump into the sermon, I wanna make a big announcement. I recently released a new book called How to Become a Prayer Warrior. This year will be a year of divine breakthrough if you learn how to pray. And that's why I wrote this book. I wanna teach you how to pray. In this book, I give you the principles of prayer, the power behind prayer, 14 different forms of prayer with practical application at the end of each chapter to get you praying now. I believe that God wants to elevate your relationship with Him. And I hope that through this book, you find the keys that you need to become a prayer warrior. So you can click the link below and grab your copy in any version, digital or physical, and get this book this year. I believe God is gonna do great things in your life through it. Now. Let's jump into the message with a heart of expectation and let's get ready to receive everything that God has for us through this word. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Real quick, if you are here for the very first time, would you just wave at me real quick and can we put our hands together for all of our first time guests? We're so glad to see you. And listen, we are a church for you. If this is your first time in church, maybe you've never been in a church building before. Today, we are so glad that you're joining us today. But I will say, it's Easter Sunday, so it's going to get a little churchy in the house of God today. I'm just letting you know now, we're going to get a little churchy. And I'm, I'm a church kid. I was raised in church. And Easter Sunday is Super Bowl for Christians. Any 49er fans in the house? Hey, there were more boos in the 10 a.m. and then there were the 11.45, okay. So y'all know what it feels like when your team is in the big game. You know how excited you were? Our team is in the big game and newsflash, we already won. We got the victory. So it's a, I'm just telling you now, it's about to get churchy up in here. And I know we've got a lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds, but I'm a hollaback preacher, which means when I preach, you need to. And this is a big room, and I'm losing my voice already, so I need you to help me preach this message. But for those of you who are new and you've never been around church before, you'll quickly learn that church people, we say churchy things. We call it Christianese. It's a whole language. We, we, you know, we create it. And we understand what we're saying, but maybe you're here today and you have no idea what we're talking about. So I just want to explain a few of our sayings that you might hear on Easter Sunday. The first saying goes like this. How many of y'all may ever made a mistake in your life? You made a mess of things. Come on. Can we just be honest in church? Okay. I made some mistakes just this past week. And uh, we have a saying in the church because the church is a place where the gospel is preached and the gospel is good news. Somebody say good news. And so if you made mistakes and you made a mess of your life, I came to tell you you're in good company. You're surrounded by a whole bunch of people that are stuck in their mess, but thanks be to God, he made a miracle out of our mess. So if you've ever made a mess and you showed up to church, you might have a church mama that saw you looking down and feeling somber, and they would come up to you and they would say this, baby, Listen, whatever you've done, don't worry. It's all under the blood. Somebody say it's under the blood. Now, I know you you may have never heard that before, but when we say blood, we're not talking about like a horror film. We're talking about the blood of Jesus. And what we're basically saying here is whatever you've done is all good because your past has been forgiven and your future has been empowered. Somebody say it's under the blood. Okay, second phrase. We say this really on Easter Sunday. Now, now, if you grew up in like a gospel church, you'd understand that there are just some things that when the pastor says on Easter Sunday, it's going to get you up out of your seat. Kind of like these crazy people that stand on the front row and they start waving a hanky. They may even throw a shoe at the preacher. Maybe you've been in a dark place and you're going through a valley, the valley of the shadow of death. We've got a saying because even if you're in a dark place, the pastor will say something like this. On the third day, even in the darkness, when there looked to be no way, God made a way and he got up. I came to tell you he got up. And if he got up, you and I can't get up. I came to tell you this morning. Okay, so, 
So when you see people standing up and shouting down, the, that's just what we're, we're doing. We're getting excited because we know what Jesus did for us. For us. Now, here's the last one. This is my favorite one. This is my, my favorite one. Maybe you've been through the valley, and come out on the, on the other side, and you got a victory. Come on. Anybody got a, got a testimony of the goodness of Jesus? I, I'm grateful. And so, so when God's got, when God's God's done something good, good in your life, we got to start a saying for that too. We'll look, we'll look at each other and we'll say, wait, won't he do it? I say, won't, won't he do it? And now when I say me do it, do it, you got to respond with won't, won't he will. Now, won't he will? I say, Pastor, Pastor, that's not good English. It doesn't matter. It's churchy language. It doesn't need to make sense to you. It makes just, it makes sense to us. But, but won't he will, it's not three words. It's one word. Yeah. Won't he will? Okay? So we're going to practice. When I say won't he do it, I need you to shout won't he will. And if you got a testimony, if you've got a story of God's goodness in your life, I need you to shout it out. I said won't he do it? I said won't he do it? I said won't he do it? Oh, he already did it. Somebody give God some praise. All right, all right. We got it taken care of. Hit your neighbor and say, neighbor, take me to church. Now, I'm, I'm a church kid. I've, I've been in church my whole life, which means I've heard every Easter sermon you could possibly preach, okay, from every perspective. Because listen, it's not an easy thing to preach the same story every year. You, you got to keep it fresh. And so growing up in church, I've heard every perspective of the Easter story. I, I've, I've heard it from the perspective of Pontius Pilate. I've heard it from the perspective of Peter and the disciples. Yeah. I've heard the story from the Roman centurions, and I've heard the story from Jesus himself. I've heard every Easter story, but I'll tell you one story I've never heard in a sermon. I've never heard the Easter story preached from the perspective of the stone. Now, I already know you're looking at me and I'm rolling your eyes and saying, Pastor, you're really going to talk to us from the perspective of a stone? Yes, I am, because I believe that the stone has the most significant story of all in the Easter narrative. I, I, I truly believe that the story of the stone is going to shine a new light on what God wants to do in your story and we have to go all the way to where it starts with the stone. I want to go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 62. It says this. This was after Jesus was crucified and he was buried. And it says, the next day, the one after preparation day, the priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while Jesus was still alive, that deceiver, can you hear the contempt in their voice? That deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, the disciples may come and steal the body and stage a resurrection. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate said. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went to the tomb and secured it by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. As I read this story, I asked this question this week. If stones could speak, what story would they share with us? Can you imagine what the stone must have felt? I know it's an inanimate object. Humor me for a moment, okay? Can you imagine what the stone must have felt to be chosen amongst all the other stones for the most significant assignment in the resurrection story. The job that the stone had was literally to guard the man named Jesus. The responsibility it had to refuse the possibility of resurrection, to contain the very king of the Jews, to guard the man that claimed to be God. Somebody say you had one job. The reality is that while the purpose of the stone was simple, it was extremely significant to the resurrection story. Its job was to prevent people from getting to Jesus and to keep Jesus from getting to you and I. And the Bible tells us that the stone was sealed so that there was no opportunity 
for escape. The stone was set so that it could not be moved by mankind, and the stone was secured with soldiers so there was no chances of God getting out alive. And as I pondered over the purpose of this piece of earth obstructing any opportunity for a God encounter, I realized that the stone was not just a stone, but a symbol of something you and I struggle with in our own souls. In fact, the reality is is that each of us have a stone that is sitting in our soul that is separating us from the God who came to save us. If stones could speak, I think that that stone would identify itself as sin in our lives. The Bible tells us that every single person under the sound of my voice, whether you're in this room or watching online, has struggled with the stone of separation due to the sin in our own souls. Romans 3, 23 says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have the stone of sin inside of us. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says this, but your iniquities, another word for sin, have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. This is what sin does in our lives. Sin separates us from the very God who came to save us. And my question for you is this, if the stone in your life could speak, what would it identify itself to be? Because each of us, while we have a unique stone, that stone represents a different struggle. For some of you here today, the stone that's separating you and God is the stone of anger and disillusionment. That at some point in your journey, God let you down and didn't do things the way you wanted him to. And so now, out of your resentment, there is something refusing from you to get to God, and it's in the way separating you from salvation. Maybe your stone is addiction something you just can't let go of. It has a hold on you. And every time you see the stone, you feel the struggle that separates you from a holy God. Maybe, maybe you're here and the stone of separation is hurt from church. I'm not ignorant enough to realize that this many people in a room this size have experienced church hurt and trauma that has caused you to run from God. And maybe the stone of separation in your story is the disappointment of church leaders who let you down and you've been running from God. Can I tell you, if you've been running from God, God is chasing after you and he just happens to run faster than you do. I came to tell you, he's chasing you down this morning. And while they disappointed you, He will never let you down. In fact, he has such a great plan and a purpose for your life. But the reality is, is that when we look at the stone in our souls, we see the size and the strength of it. Many of us feel that our sin is too great for God to overcome. But praise be to God that the Easter story reminds us that the rock of sin was rattled that Sunday morning. And what was meant to shackle you and shut you out has been shaken off of you. I came to prophesy on Easter Sunday that the very thing that separated you from God was shaken on Easter morn. In fact, the Bible tells us that that very morning, on the first day of the week, Mary and the other Mary went to look at the tomb, but there was a violent earthquake. And I think that if stones could speak, they would say that that stone was shook. Somebody say, I'm shook. That stone in your life, the very thing that stands against you, was shaken the day that a resurrection power revealed itself on Easter Sunday. 
I remember when I was in elementary school, I had a best friend, a BFFL for life. His name was Tommy. And we were inseparable. We hung out every day. We had sleepovers every weekend. He was my best friend. And we were very different. He was super smart, always got the best grade in class. I was not so smart, had different talents, and so opposites attracted, and we, we were best friends. But there was a kid in our class named Marcelo. He was a bully. Y'all ever dealt with a bully before? He was a big bully. Tommy, my best friend, was bigger than me. And this guy was about five times bigger than Tommy. So he was really bigger than me, but he didn't really pick on me. He liked to pick on Tommy because that's what insecure bullies do. They pick on people because they're jealous of them. And so every time Tommy would get a good grade, he would make fun of Tommy. And one day I just had it. You ever just, you ever just had it? I was over. I was done. And so that day I remember I'm going to come in. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to set this guy right. And sure enough, I walked into my classroom and he's picking on my friend. He's making fun of him. And so I went up to him. I said, Hey, I said it with my chest. You know, hey, in my elementary high pitch voice, Hey, man, stop messing with my friend. Now, I thought Marcelo was going to run out to class. Instead of running, he grabbed me by the shoulders and he pinned me down on the desk. Now, after I peed my pants and I regained composure, something rose up on the inside of me. You ever do something just stupid? And you look back and you're like, why did I do that? But it's that fight or flight thing in me. And that day, flight was not an option. I was going to fight. I remember I cocked my hand back and I went like this. But right before I hit him, I paused. And you'll never imagine what happened. For the first time, this bully flinched. And everybody in the class went, oh. They probably didn't do that, but that's what I heard in my head. He got off of me. He walked out. I have never felt more gangster in my life, y'all. I, I walked with my chest out that whole day. That's what's up. You see, don't mess with me. But something was revealed and exposed that day that somebody that looked stronger than me, in a moment when he flinched, he revealed that there was fear on the inside of him. Can I tell you that the day resurrection showed up and the ground began to shake and the stone began to quake? That was the day the devil flinched and revealed he's afraid of what God has already done. And the moment he shook, the moment he flinched, you and I could realize that the rock in my life was rendered powerless. Oh, I know it looks big and bad. I know it's strong and seems like it's too great for anything to overcome. But that day, somebody say that day, when God showed up and the earth began to shake, so did the very thing that stood against me. Somebody say, I'm shook. I want you to know this today, that the size and the strength of sin in your life does not compare to the strength of your risen Savior. But pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. I may not know what you've done, but I can tell you this, nothing that you've done is more powerful than what Jesus did for you on that cross. There is nothing you could do to outdo and undo what Jesus purchased for you on the cross. Oh, pastor, I'm still struggling with my sin. I'm still wrestling. Can I tell you? The fact that you're struggling is a sign that something is shaking and God is about to shake that thing off of you. It may not be gone right now, but I'm telling you, he got up and he got out. And if he got out, you're about to get out too. God's about to shake the very thing off of you that tried to shackle you down. Somebody say, I'm shook. Not only was the rock of sin rendered powerless and the stone shook under the power of the Holy Spirit, but the rock was put to shame. Look at what Colossians 2.15 says. It says, having disarmed the powers and authorities. He's talking about the, the satanic, demonic power of sin in the world. It says, he made a public spectacle of them. He put them to shame by triumphing over them through the cross. In fact, I think that if stones could speak, they would say it was a setup. Somebody say it was a setup. You see, if stones could speak on Saturday, 
they would tell us they were successful because Saturday was silent. Saturday, we wept and we wallowed wondering if resurrection was ever going to be a reality. And I think that if stones could speak on Saturday, they would say, we've officially pressed pause on those who came to praise God. We have silenced the worshipers and we have shut out the seekers and it is quiet here on Saturday. What the stone forgot was what Jesus said on Palm Sunday, that if they were silent, even the rocks, even the stones would cry out. And because Saturday was silent, the rock had no choice but to surrender and shout and shake under the power of God. Somebody say it was a setup. And if God is silent in your life, just you wait and see. Because silence is a precursor to the supernatural thing God is about to do in your life. Some of you are in a silent Saturday season and you feel like God has abandoned you. My Bible says that when there's silence, even the rocks that are holding you back, even the stone that is separating you from God has no choice but to surrender itself under the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, I'm shook. But it wasn't just a shaking that happened. Look at this, verse 2. It says, there is a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, and rolled back the stone. If stones could speak, they would say, that stone was shifted. That stone was moved even when they said it was impossible. If you think about it, the disciples and the women who followed Jesus, what they had seen for the past few days was excruciating. They had seen a scene of their Savior that they had never seen before. Up until this point, they'd seen signs and wonders power and miracles. They'd seen the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords exalted all over Jerusalem and Galilee. They watched as Jesus performed miracle after miracle. But over the past few days, miracle turned to misery and promise turned into pain. And sometimes you can't unsee what you've seen. Sometimes when you witness something so gruesome, it's hard to get that gruesome out of your mind's eye. The Bible tells us that even as they rallied around the grave, they struggled with the scene that they looked upon. Look at this in Mark chapter 16. It says, early in the morning, they came to the tomb and they said to themselves, who will roll away the stone for us? They had seen a block and a burden that now it was hindering what they believed could be possible. What you see oftentimes becomes your story. And what you look at determines the lens in which you view your life. And for many of us, what we've done is we've seen the stone of struggle for so long that the struggle has become our life story. Can I preach for a second? All you've seen is that addiction. So now, because that's all you've been looking at, you define your life by the limitations of your flesh. Because I struggle with addiction, I just must be an addict. This is who I am, who I'm all, all I'm ever gonna be. When my Bible says that if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Sure, I might struggle, but I've got a new identity. But when that's what you've seen for so long, it determines your story. When you look at your marriage and all you see is argument and anger and frustration and failure, the longer you look at the illusion that the enemy has placed in front of your eyes, the more you believe that nothing else is possible. 
Have you ever watched those videos online where they're like, look at the screen for 60 seconds. It's all these colors and moving shapes. And then they say, after 60 seconds, look around the room. And there's like shapes everywhere. It's called an optical illusion. The longer you look at a lie, the more it'll change your lens. And the more you see the struggle, the more the enemy will convince you that's who you are. But I came to tell you, on Easter Sunday, God didn't just shake the stone. He shifted it out of you. And he rolled it back because that's not who you are anymore. What have you seen that the devil has tried to set in stone in your story? What struggle, what suffering have you experienced that the enemy is trying to convince you that's a permanent pillar in your life? I came to prophesy over you today that your struggle is not set in stone and your pain is not permanent. It is just an illusion. And when you realize that God has rolled back the very thing that separated you from him, you will realize there is nothing that separates you from God any longer. Psalm 103 verse 12 says this, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Why did the angel roll back the stone? Have you ever thought about that? Many of us think it's because Jesus was in there trying to get out. Like, hey, I'm alive. Let me out. But when you read about the resurrected Savior, it says he walked through walls. He was no longer bound by the constraints he lived in. Can I tell you, he wasn't in there anymore. The angel didn't roll back the stone for God to get out. The angel rolled back the stone so you and I could go in. Now I'm preaching. When you go in the empty tomb and you realize you're not what you thought you were, he ain't in your pain no longer, he's moved on from your sin, you realize I'm a new creation in Christ. And if he got up, I can get up too. Woo, let me tell you, when you see a new scene, an empty tomb, the grave has been robbed. God got up. And here's the problem with you and I. God rolled back the stone. And now you and I, we want to keep reminding God of what he rolled away. I get it because we feel shame and we feel guilt and we feel bad. And I was taught that when I come to church, I'm just supposed to be like this. God, I'm so sorry. My Bible says he forgave and forgot your sins. Stop reminding God of what he already forgot about your life. He no longer sees you in your sin with the stone of separation. He sees you in his son, Jesus. I'm preaching to myself right now. I put myself in a fit. You need to see something different. That's why Romans chapter 12 says, be not conformed to the likeness of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to see that the grave is empty and stop staring at the stone of struggle in your life and start looking at Jesus who has saved you and redeemed you from the power of sin. He shook the stone and he shifted the stone, but Jesus wasn't finished because I love Jesus. He's a gangster. And he said, you try to put me to shame, I'm going to put you to shame. Devil, you tried to come against me. You tried to convince my people that I was dead. I want you to know I'm alive and not alive. I'm alive and well. And as I bring this to a conclusion, I want you to see what happened here in this story. In verse 2, it says, there was a violent earthquake. The angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled back the stone, and here's the key, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. And his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Now come and see the place where he lay. I think that if stones could speak, they would say this. Your stone has become his seat. 
Your stone has become his seat. I pray that at this 1145 worship experience, I'm surrounded by Christians who are willing to be honest about the fact that there are some things that are a part of our past that we're not so proud of. Can we just be honest for a second? There are parts of your testimony you have no problem telling people about, but there are some things that you hope never get shared because those things are extremely shameful. I have some places in my life, some memories that I wish I could forget, some mistakes that I have made that I wish I could just erase from the account of my life, people that have hurt me and people that I have hurt. And when I look back on my life, there are times where I've prayed to God and asked him, God, can you just erase these memories from my mind? Have you ever prayed that prayer? God, can you just undo the past? Because when I look at these things, I feel like I'm unqualified, disqualified from being used by you. And I remember this moment where God spoke to me a few years ago as I was praying that prayer, thinking about the things and the moments that have caused me shame in my life. <clears throat> and I remember the Holy Spirit speaking to me in the gentlest way that he could. And he said this to me. He said, Jared, I cannot undo your past. And I cannot erase it, but I promise you, I will use it. And God began to reveal to me that the stone of struggle in my life that I wish could just be removed was not removed by God. In fact, I have bad news for you today. God will not remove the rock of regrets in your life but he promises to redeem it. In fact, he says this, I will take your struggle and I will turn it into a stage. I will take your suffering and I will turn it into a sermon. I will use the very things that you were ashamed of and use it to shine the light of the gospel. When people look at you, they will say, if God did it for you, he can do it for them. And I don't know about you, but I wish the angel would have just demolished and destroyed the stone altogether because I don't want to look at this thing. I don't want to remember the rock of my regrets. I don't even want to, I don't want it in my perspective at all. And yet the angel doesn't just roll it. He decides to reside upon it. The Bible says the angel sits on the very thing that represents my struggle and my shame and my embarrassment, embarrassment and my humiliation. He sits on the very thing I don't want to see anymore. And I ask myself, why did God choose to have the angel, the representative of heaven, sit on the very stone that separated me from God in the first place? And I think it's because the angel needed to give the disciples a new picture and a new perspective. You see, they had seen a suffering Savior for the past few days, and it's hard to forget some of those memories. But in this moment, the angel of the Lord appeared and sat on the very thing that stood between us and God, and he sat on top of it. Why? because he needed to paint a picture of a victorious king. In fact, as I read the story, I was reminded of Hebrews chapter 10 that says this, that our great high priest, once he made a sacrifice for sin, sat down at the right hand of God. Can I get Bible nerdy for a second? Jesus, once he was crucified, and arose again. The Bible says that he sat down in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and he is seated on something called the mercy seat. Say the mercy seat. The mercy seat 
is a representation of what was on top of the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. You see, the Ark of the Covenant was the place that was the picture of the presence of God that would go with the people of God wherever they travel. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant, two cherubim, angels, in between was something called the mercy seat. Say the mercy seat. And the mercy seat would be the place where the high priest would take the blood of the sacrificial lamb and smear it across the mercy seat. Because where the blood sat on the mercy seat, that meant that mercy was now flowing to all of humanity. And when Jesus sat on the mercy seat in heaven, the blood began to flow and victory came to you and I. And the angel of the Lord say here, I'm sitting atop the very thing that was your struggle to remind you that the mercy seat has Jesus seated on the throne. And now, a new story of salvation was being preached to all of humanity, that the very thing you struggled with is now the story of God's saving grace in your life. I came to encourage somebody that's struggling with the stone of their history, the stones of your past, the rocks of your regrets. Can I tell you, your stone has become his seat. And if you have a stone in your life, go ahead and own your stone. Go ahead and sit on top of the very thing that God turned from being a trauma to a testimony, from being your history to being your destiny. I came to tell you that that stone is now a stage for the story of salvation to be preached in your life. If you've got a stone, you've got a story. If God has delivered you, You've got a testimony of the goodness of Jesus in your life. And as the angel sat atop the stone, he painted the picture of Jesus, our conquering king, that now sits atop the things that we struggle with. He has conquered them all. Sin no longer has power over your life. You have been given victory. And I got so caught up in the story of the stone that I forgot about the soldiers. Y'all remember the soldiers? Because the Bible says that there were guards stationed at the stone to make sure that even if Jesus escaped or he got up, he couldn't get out. They made sure that there were reminders of your regrets. Come on, the enemy sends people into your life to remind you of your past and to pull you back into the very things that God delivered you from. Those thoughts and those reminders when you feel, oh, God's moving in your life and the devil says, you're not worthy. You shouldn't lift your hands. I know where those hands have been. And he sends reminders into your life to secure that you never get out of the grave he wants to lock you in. What happened to the soldiers that were stationed at the stone? Can I read it again? It says in verse 4, The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. You know what that means? That means that as the angel showed up and Jesus was resurrected and the angel of the Lord sat atop the stone of separation, that the soldiers that were stationed to secure death in your life had to bow their knee before the King of Kings. I'm reminded when my Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. If the stone became his seat, the soldiers became his footstool. That's why Hebrews says 
that when he sat down at the right hand of God, put it up on the screen so they can see it. He sat down declaring resurrection power. But then the next verse says this. Now he waits as his enemies are made his footstool. What was the angel prophesying? The devil that you've struggled with is under your feet. Addiction is under your feet. Shame is under your feet. Fear is under your feet. So when the enemy shows up to try to remind you that you're not worthy of the love of God, you can look him in the face and say, you are under my, come on, help me. You are under my feet, devil. I'm not going to give you victory over my life. I've got the power of God. I want you to stand to your feet all across this room. Somebody say, it's under my feet. I came to prophesy to you today that because the stone has become his seat, your enemies have become his footstool. That the things you think you struggle with and the things you feel like have strength over your life, no, baby, they're underneath your feet. I think that if stones could speak, they would tell us this, that if you're struggling with the stone of sin, they would say, baby, it's all under the blood. Come on, help me. If stones could speak, I think that for those of us who are in a dark valley and we feel like we're stuck in death, they would speak to us and say this, on the third day, he got up. And I think if stones could speak when we experience resurrection power, they would cry out and say, won't he do it? Help me. Won't he will? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Somebody give God some praise. Maybe you're here today and your heart is the stone. Calloused and protected and hardened by the hurts and the headaches in your life. Today, God is shaking off the very thing that has been shackling you down. Maybe, maybe your heart hasn't been moved like this in years. Today, God is shifting your heart into a place of an encounter with his presence. But the most important thing I need you to understand today is this, that God wants to make your heart the seat that he is enthroned upon in your life. Is God enthroned upon your heart? Or have you pushed him out due to the pains and the disillusionment in your life? Today, I want you to know on this Resurrection Sunday, it's time to yield your heart to Jesus and to surrender your life to God and to allow him to release resurrection over your life so that dead things can be awakened and you can experience the right relationship with God that he purchased for you on that cross. 